blood, the lymph nodes, and later on will go in the central nervous system. And then eventually, if they don't have treatment, they will fall into a coma and die. The last decades of the 20th century have been very productive in terms of new treatment, but nothing happened for those very neglected patients. Personally, when I was working with uh, MSF uh, during the 80s, 90s, I was confronted to a situation that was particularly dramatic because the only treatment available to treat civic uh, illness was mersoprol, an arsenic derivative, killing one out of 20 of patients because of toxicity. It was described by patients as fire in the veins. In my prayer, I said, God, there is no way to clarify to search pour qu'ils trouvent un médicament facile à prendre pour soigner ces gens qui meurent, ne fût-ce qu'en comprimé. The first step has been to improve the situation with a combination of nifertimox and nephrodytin called NECT. So this is NECT, and all this is for one patient. Le NECT est un bon médicament, et très efficace et qui guérit plus facilement. Mais c'est la logistique qui est lourde parce que c'est fait, et il faut transporter ces cartons et l'amener dans le milieu où il y a des malades. Souvent, ils sont dans des forêts, ils sont dans des villages. Uh, the, this treatment is available only for the second stage of the disease. So you need to go through a, a very difficult and painful lumbar puncture that every patient need to, to be confronted with. Ceux qui viennent à l'hôpital, on est obligé de les garder parce que on doit contrôler la perfusion. C'est toi, c'est donné en intraveineuse. And the consequence is, we wanted to have a novel treatment to treat all the stages of the disease. So we started uh, our research on this field uh, with a basis that uh, one class of drugs, uh, nitromidazole, was having uh, an effect on this sort of parasite. So we have organize a data mining of all the, the different compounds of nitromidazole coming from uh, university, coming from pharmaceutical company. One presented uh, the characteristic of, of, of what we were looking uh, for, a molecule that was called fexinidazole, and it was developed during the 80s and abandoned because of lack of interest of developing a product for parasitology. Sanofi had the molecule, but we partnered with DNDI, who brought the experience from preclinical research and being able to do the clinical trials in these very difficult to reach areas. We started the study in 2012 in DRC and Central African Republic. It was incredible to have to think about how you would do sophisticated clinical research in an unsophisticated setting. La FDC est un grand pays et la logistique est, elle est lourde. There was poor infrastructure, lack of scientific lab equipment. No one trained on doing clinical research and the political instability in these regions. To overcome these challenges, we had to bring electricity. We had to bring microscopes. We also brought some technology like internet and satellites to make sure we would have the connection. We did training of 200 people in good clinical practice, in pharmacovigilance, to make sure that they could comply with what is needed to have a new drug registered according to international standards. We supported the national programs with cars, with boats, to go and look for patients. We work with the best teams, those that know how to diagnose these patients. Those that are treating these patients. Banana 
kabila ki na koma ki makais na lamba na kina zamba na lamba yito pina bana na ngato zabi tata ilo ki makais na yezo. Patients can be treated much closer to where they live. We have confidence in patients, and it's good. We're on the path to elimination of sleeping sickness. It's not utopia anymore to be able to do this incredible research in these incredible conditions. If we bring the right partner together, we can achieve the best science for a very negative population. The first thing is that we have to do it. C'est merveilleux. C'est merveilleux. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, actually, I would like to do this section inofficially. I want to do it in a formal way. So, uh, welcome, Professor Bernard Picot, and also Jean Michel, and also my colleagues from uh, uh, Faculty of Public Health at the Mahidon University, and my uh, colleagues from several research centers in the Faculty of Medicine City Hospital. Likewise, Dr. Yot. Uh, who is one of our strategic partners in implementing many, many initiatives to cope with the health problems in this country. Um, the first time when I heard about you, Bernard, uh, it's almost exactly the same day I got your name from Kun Kanya, uh, mentioned to me that uh, our clinical research center is cyclist would like to have a collaboration with the NDI. At the same time, I'm a member of the International Award Committee of Prince Mahidon Award. And at that time, uh, someone nominated your name and also the DNDI as a candidate for Prince Mahidon Award, uh, Lollius, uh, two years ago. And uh, we, we went through uh, several information uh, about your contribution. And at last, at the end, when the International Award Committee decide to put your name forward to the Prince Mahidon Award Foundation as the, as the Prince Mahidon Award laureates, I came back to tell Gun Kanya, and a few days later, we had a teleconference. Uh, uh, I could not mention to, con I could not congratulate you at that time because officially we need to nominate your name to the foundation and the decision will be decided, will be done on in the meeting, in the meeting of the foundation. But anyway, uh, good to have you here and good to have you as another lawyer as a Prince Mahidon Award. Uh, so today, uh, as you request, uh, we, we ask people to come to join this meeting uh, regarding the hepatitis C. And my colleagues from, from the Universal Coverage Scheme, he, he, he planned to come right today. Uh, I do believe he's on his way. And there are two people in the Ministry of Public Health who will be online to join this conference. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Tobisa is the one who worked very hard to combat the hepatitis C in this country. Hopefully he can join you and also provide you some information or experience in Thailand. So welcome, Bernard, and welcome, Sean Michel. I wel welcome everyone to this meeting. Wunganya is going to introduce Bernard to everyone, so please. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Thailand, Professor Bernard Pico. And uh, thank you, everyone. We have a lot of people online for this session. And um, uh, this is, uh, seems to be a nice small room, but actually outside, you know, uh, several uh, hundreds of people are attending this meeting. And uh, this is the PMAC academic session, um, which is um, uh, the special session that we want to hold uh, exactly just to uh, discuss about innovation to access. And today is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Bernard Pico, who is the executive director of the NDI uh, and the uh, DNDI permanent uh, uh, board. 
member. Dr. Picard has led the uh, DNDI since the foundation of uh, in 2003. Under his guidance, uh, the DNDI, who, which is not uh, a nonprofit organization, uh, very famous now, uh, <laughs> a research and development organization with hundreds of public and pri uh, private partners. Uh, DNDI has delivered um, nine new treatments for six deadly diseases, neglected diseases, very importantly. Um, uh, it has developed a robust uh, portfolio of projects spanning from discovery to implementation, such as sleeping sickness, dysmaniasis, uh, Chagas disease, philaliasis, mycetoma, HIV, hepatitis C, and COVID-19. Uh, DNDI aims for uh, delivering more than uh, 15 additional treatments by 2028. It's a, a very ambitious goal, but I think uh, it will be achieving. Uh, the initiative uh, through the, its R&D work also built capacity in disease endemic countries through research platforms and technology transfer and advocates for greater public uh, leadership to sustainably address the health needs, particularly for the neglected uh, diseases. Um, prior to the NDI, Dr. Picol uh, was the director of Medicine Sun Frontier. Everybody know MSF? Uh, uh, it's campaign for access to essential medicine from 1998 to 2003. Uh, and um, he took the position of executive director of MSS France before uh, taking the position of uh, uh, director of uh, uh, MSF uh, overall. And um, uh, while working with MSF, Dr. Pico carried out the field mission in several countries like Africa, Latin America, and Asia. In 1988, he co-founded Epicenter and MSF uh, affiliated NGO specialized uh, in epidemiology. Uh, your work, Dr. Picol, has uh, really inspired a lot of people uh, who wants to work uh, with global impact. After obtaining uh, his medical degree in University of Clermont-Ferrand, France, um, Dr. Picol also earned a master's degree in public health at Tulane University in the United States of America in 2012. He was awarded an honorary doctor of laws uh, degree by the University of Dundee in UK. Uh, in 2020, he was awarded the Prince Mahidol Award in the field of public health by the Prince Mahidol Award Foundation Thailand. And today uh, he comes to Thailand uh, to receive his award. Um, and he's also a member uh, of the Joint Coordination Board of the Special Program of Tropical Diseases um, uh, research of the Bay Show and a former board member of United Medicine Patent Pool. So it's our privilege that we have Dr. Pikau today with us in Bangkok and take this opportunity for, for us to have him uh, giving the opening uh, lecture and talk uh, in a special PMAC academic session. So uh, Dr. Pikau will be um, uh, uh, talking about the medicine from the medicine innovation to access to treatment for all. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me welcoming Dr. Picol uh, for his special talk today. Uh, I'm very, I'm very happy to be here in Bangkok with you. Uh, for me, uh, Bangkok represents an important part of uh, my life because with my wife, we've spent two years in, in Thailand in 85-86, uh, leading the project of MSF at the time of uh, the presence of many refugees in this country. So we were working on, uh, on uh, many different uh, refugee camps, uh, working a lot on infectious diseases already because we've been very involved on the field of uh, Tuberculosis uh, mentioned yesterday that we tested the six months treatment at, at this, that time uh, in the camp of uh, Kawidang, but also very involved on malaria because uh, malaria was really pregnant. So, uh, well, uh, really, I'm very connected and linked uh, uh, with this country, with, uh, with the population of Thailand, because 
it was really a very, very nice period in my life. Uh, and uh, based on, on this experience uh, in Thailand, but in experience in many different countries, uh, we have uh, uh, developed uh, the concept of, uh, of uh, uh, lack of, uh, of uh, adapted good drugs or treatment for many different diseases. So uh, this was uh, at the origin of uh, what you mentioned as the international access campaign uh, created in uh, 1998, but uh, also uh, 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 it was also the period of time where uh, we decided to uh, assess the environment of research and development and innovation for uh, what we have called neglected diseases, but it was a sort of new world at that time. In fact, it was diseases affecting a large number of people, but uh, uh, with very little investment uh, in, in, in R&D. And maybe I will tell a story because the first meeting that we organized on this topic, that we co-organized in fact with WHO, was set up in Paris, exactly the day MSF received the Nobel Peace Prize. And at that time, we decided to dedicate the money and uh, the investment from, from the Nobel Peace Prize to document better uh, uh, the, this uh, uh, lack of research uh, called in, in many publications uh, uh, fatal imbalance because uh, we documented that uh, uh, only 1% uh, of the drugs uh, or the product discovered during the period from 75 to 1999, only 1% were dedicated to uh, uh, diseases uh, that we call neglected diseases, but represent a large number, 12% of the global uh, uh, disease burden. So this, uh, some older uh, were using the wording of the 1090 gap. Uh, uh, so the totally, uh, unbalanced investment in this disease versus, versus the public health problem. And, and, and today, uh, this unbalance uh, still remain uh, with some progress, but still remain. So we have to keep in mind that uh, there is still a need for a lot of, uh, of investment and progress. So it's why uh, uh, we started initially with a, with a working group, uh, uh, with bringing together uh, people uh, from different origin. In fact, from Thailand, uh, uh, Professor uh, Young Yus Yutavong was, was part of this working group. But after two years, uh, those people say, okay, please, we cannot just talk and publish. We need to create something. So this was the concept of creating a new initiative called DNDI was born from, from this uh, conception. And, and MSF was, was, support, uh, was a supporter of this project, but at the same time, MSF was saying, we cannot go alone because we need support from uh, public research institution. We need support from scientists. So it's why uh, the initial group was created with, uh, with support from uh, different institutes from, from Brazil, from Africa, a network in Africa, under the leadership of the Kenyan Medical Research Institute. Uh, in, in this region was Malaysia took, taking the, the lead, but with the concept of building building a, a regional network, uh, same in, in, in India. And, uh, and the Institute Pasteur as well uh, accepted to join uh, the creation. So the, all those uh, groups have signed the initial chart to create uh, the NDI. And of course, WHO was uh, an, an important member from the start and continued to be a very close, close partner to, to, to the NDI. So, we started with uh, uh, the concept of three uh, pillars on our, on our mission. So one uh, that I will develop further is uh, we want to develop a new product. So we are an R&D uh, group with development and even development until access in our mind. The second pillar that is very important also, we consider that if we want to support a sustainable uh, solution, so sustainable response to this problem, we have to work with partners and build, strengthen existing capacity uh, in, in a disease dynamic country. This is key in our vision and is what we will discuss today and in, in the following days in our meeting. 
And third, uh, it's a more, uh, I would say, a policy advocacy objective. We consider that uh, we need to uh, use our experience to influence the environment and change uh, the rule of the game. Uh, because today, uh, uh, there is a lack of, uh, of, uh, of environment, there is a lack of incentive to in, uh, invest into this field. So here, uh, this uh, element of advocacy is also very important if we want to have a, a sustainable response to this big concern. So um, the, the wording of partnership is, is fundamental uh, on, uh, on, uh, on the philosophy of DNDI. We, we used to say that uh, without our partner, uh, DNDI is nothing. We cannot deliver anything because we are, we are a sort of virtual organization that coordinate activity, but involve uh, uh, partners uh, from the different uh, institutions. Of course, a lot of partners uh, from the academic and public health institution, a lot of partners from pharma. And, and when, when we mention pharmaceutical uh, companies, we, we have in mind the big one, uh, the big pharma, but also uh, 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 generic company or, or, or companies that have a major contribution to our effort. So we are uh, also, because we are involved on in treatment, uh, we are also uh, associated with partner on diagnosis because this, this combination is fundamental if you want to respond. We have uh, partners uh, on, on, on access. Uh, so because for us, R&D is not the end of the day. If we don't uh, prepare uh, the access strategy, we will fail. And, and to repeat a key message, uh, we, we try to have a maximum of partners in low and middle income countries. So today, uh, uh, today, uh, on, we have on, uh, ongoing more than 200 uh, uh, partnership uh, uh, from different parts of the world. Uh, as you will see later, we also try to promote SARS to SARS collaboration. I think we, we think that this is a way forward uh, to solve many of the issues in the future is to have uh, countries uh, uh, from Asia working with uh, countries in Latin America or in Africa uh, to uh, conduct uh, uh, some, some of the research and achieve uh, faster, uh, good results. So we have a, a series of six uh, tenets that uh, really are all important for, for, for the way we conduct uh, our, uh, our strategy. Uh, the first one is uh, to be uh, patient needs driven. So while the patients are at the core of our activity, we want to keep independence from, from uh, different partners. So this was uh, an important aspect, particularly on, on, a, on a funding of the NDI, because uh, our board decided that we don't want to have a single donor representing 25% uh, of our resources in order to keep the capacity to decide uh, at, at, a, at, a, uh, at a board level on, on, on priorities. So of course we promote uh, col collaborative research uh, open source and, and transparency uh, in terms of uh, information, but also in terms of cost. Uh, uh, so transparency is, is fundamental as a, as a principle. So globally uh, network, uh, uh, access is part of our initial thinking. Even if we, when we work on a, on a very early stage uh, uh, R&D, uh, we have access in mind because we, we try to keep in mind the characteristic of the product that we, we want to work. Or in transformative because uh, we expect that uh, our model that is, uh, is a small uh, initiative compared to the, to the magnitude of the problem, but our model could be used by others uh, to, uh, to change the dynamic. So what we have delivered, uh, I will not repeat, you have say nine treatment uh, for six different diseases until now. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of, uh, of uh, clinical uh, trials uh, conducted in, in many different places. Permanently, we have a minimum of 20 ongoing clinical studies. Uh, we, have, uh, 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 we have set up uh, 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 a very large network and in some places, some uh, what we call clinical research platform. So here on investment, the sustainable investment in, in capacity to conduct good clinical trials. 
I think it's probably less a concern in this part of the world because you have already very good capacity. But when you are uh, in Sudan, when you are in the uh, in, uh, Republic Democratic of Congo, uh, you need to invest on, the, on this uh, capacity if you want to conduct the best, uh, uh, best quality of, of, of the clinical studies. So another aspect uh, I want to mention is that with WHO, uh, six years ago, uh, we decided to create a new initiative uh, uh, on anti antimicrobial resistance called GARP. Uh, so these initiatives have been incubated within the NDI. And three years ago, uh, this initiative took uh, some, some, uh, uh, some independence, but still very connected with the NDI. We are in the same office. We are using the same network. And I know that GARP has uh, established a good relationship here in, uh, in, in Thailand, particularly in the field of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, gonorrhea. Uh, so here is a view of, uh, of the current uh, uh, portfolio. I have a much more sophisticated slide, but as a backup. Because here is just to say that uh, in our strategy, we have combined uh, two approaches. One, one that we call the short-term, mid-term strategy, where we try to improve treatment based on existing drugs, developing new formulation, combining existing drugs. This was the initial uh, success and the initial strategy. But we have it in mind that because the pipeline was empty, so the, the lack of uh, new projects selected for infectious disease was a big problem. So we have invested with a lot of partners in discovery. And today, uh, today, uh, uh, 18 years after the start, we have a good mix of, uh, of uh, new chemical entity that are in, uh, in development. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, today uh, more than 20 new chemical entities that are uh, from, uh, from phase one to, to, to phase three, or some have been already de developed. So, and this, of course, offer a good perspective for, for the future. We know that some of them will not uh, 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 achieve uh, the, the, the end of, uh, uh, of the process, will not achieve registration. But when you have a large number, of, for, for example, in, in, in Lesh Menazis today, we have six new chemical entities in the phase of development, which give us a lot of confidence that we will be able to to develop a new treatment, totally new treatment for Lesh Menazis. The example of sleeping sickness, I, I, I don't know if you have followed the movie before, but it's, it's, very, uh, it's very demonstrative of what we are trying to achieve. Because we enter in sleeping sickness with a very, very bad situation. And this is really my background of MSF that is, is coming back. Because when I was with MSF, to treat sleeping sickness, we were using Melarsoprol, an arsenic-based derivative to treat the, the stage two of the disease. Have in mind that we will kill one out of 20 of patients because of the toxicity. So in, a, in the hospital where we were managing those patients, the atmosphere was very tense. People were coming with an infectious disease and, 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 and having the risk to die because of the toxicity of the drug. But on the other side, sleeping sickness uh, at the stage two is 100% fatal. So you have no choice. Uh, but typically, uh, my colleagues and, and myself uh, coming back from the field were saying, okay, it's not possible that at the end of the, it was still the end of the 20th century, with all the progress in medicine, we continue to use arsenic to treat uh, 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 an infectious disease. So here it was really the, the very strong rational to uh, invest on, on, on sleeping sickness. And here we, we went uh, through different steps. The first step was to uh, develop a combination of existing drugs, a fluornitin, that, a drug that was developed on oncology for cancer, uh, uh, but documented uh, as a good drug for sleeping sickness, and nifurtimox, a drug used uh, in other parasitology. Uh, and this combination work well, very good results, but still very complex because it's a set of infusion. So, okay, not very satisfied, but, but we improve a lot the management of cases. From this effort, uh, we start to work on a, on a new chemical entity called fexinidazole. So an oral treatment that was documented uh, as very active, registered, 
uh, approved by uh, European Medical Agency and, and African authorities, used now as a 10 days treatment for oral treatment for septic sickness. So major progress. But in, a, in our pipeline, we have another work that is uh, at the end of the development called Acosiborol. It's a single dose, do, single dose treatment for all forms of septic sickness. And this, of course, to, for today, we have the results from a large phase three. We continue to complete the dossier. And, but we have in mind that with this sort of drugs, we could support the objective of WHO to eliminate sleeping sickness. Because sleeping sickness, particularly the Gambian C4, uh, the reservoir is the human being. So when you treat the infected population, you stop transmission. So if you could have a rapid diagnostic test combined with a simple uh, single dose treatment, the elimination here is possible. There is no many diseases that are, are, are candidate for elimination, but CPX is a good candidate. Dengue. Uh, I think we will come back on Dengue uh, later on during this week because we have a spe specific uh, uh, conference on Dengue. But, but Dengue uh, is a new disease uh, in our portfolio. And the board of directors of the NDI decided just uh, in December 2021 to incorporate den dengue after a period of two years of uh, exploratory uh, uh, and, and feasibility. So in dengue, of course, you all uh, are aware of the needs and there is no treatment. So, uh, and, and, and we think today that uh, there is opportunities because uh, there is uh, a combination of existing drugs in a pipeline that could maybe be tested for, for dengue but as well as some new chemical entity coming, uh, coming in, a, in a pipeline. And, and probably the, the context of uh, viral diseases that you have all in mind uh, is probably in favor to have more innovation on, on dengue. So I think this is a, is a way for the future. On dengue, typically we want to implement a strategy of SARS-SARS collaboration. So it's why we, we, we will sign an agreement here in, uh, in Thailand, but we, we want to work with colleagues uh, in India, with colleagues in, uh, in Latin America, particularly in Brazil, where there is a lot of investment on dengue, a huge problem, uh, and colleagues in, in Malaysia. So this network uh, should be able to deliver a new treatment uh, in, an, in, a, in the next period. Hepatitis C, uh, in fact, is a good model maybe that will help uh, uh, dengue because hepatitis C, uh, when we enter into a, uh, this disease, was not because of lack of innovation. It was because the cost of treatment of hepatitis C when we started was around 60,000 to 80,000 US dollars per treatment. So uh, in a field where we, we knew that uh, the level of innovation was, was big, and we have assessed uh, uh, the portfolio of drugs and we discovered that some very good products have been abandoned because the winner was uh, Gilead and the other one just say, okay, we will not get the big, uh, big money on, on this disease. So, uh, so we, uh, we decided to start with, uh, with a, a product that had been abandoned with good results already of, of proof of concept. So we, we uh, set up a, a a partnership uh, uh, of uh, different companies, but also, of course, different groups, including, uh, uh, of course, a group in Thailand and Malaysia to perform and develop a phase three study. In parallel, we were working on a pharmaceutical development of Ravidasvir. And, and uh, I have to say that uh, today we can say that we have a, an excellent treatment that is very uh, effective. Uh, that is, has been registered uh, just a few months ago in Malaysia, that, and, and we should extend this re registration, and, and at a price that is affordable. Uh, so the, I think we are comparable to the best treatment on the market, but at a price that is much better. So here is just demonstration that uh, you can work in a network. Bon, I have to mention that the initial uh, product was coming from, from California, from a, a small biotech company called Presidio, but they were not capable to develop further. So we, we, we signed an agreement with them. We work with partners in Egypt, Egypt being very, very affected by hepatitis C. So they were very interested to work on hepatitis C and extended this network here in this region and Latin America. And we 
hope that with this sort of, of, of partnership, we can really bring innovation to patients. So COVID-19, because it's difficult to avoid talking about COVID-19 today. Uh, uh, so COVID-19, uh, DNA was active on COVID-19 uh, on, on three different uh, uh, or even four different aspects. But one was initially rapidly to create a, a, a sort of network and coalition to, to support clinical research uh, in uh, low and income country. Because Many groups who are totally excluded from what, what's happened in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in clinical research. So here was really to, to, to try to, to create some dynamic uh, on the contribution from, from a large number of researchers. So it was just networking. But after we set up a large study called Antikov in Africa to start 13 countries in Africa, 26 partners in a very large clinical study to try to test combination of drugs at the early stage of the disease in order to reduce the, the, the number of, uh, of uh, hospitalization. And this today is extended to, to uh, India and Brazil, where aim to recruit 6,000 people in this study. After we also invested in some uh, uh, selection of, of, of new candidates uh, in a network of, of uh, institutions accepting to, to work on an open source model to identify some new candidates. So this will be probably useful for COVID, but could be useful for next pandemic. And why not being connected with uh, Dengue? More well, and last, but at least we had quite a lot of policy advocacy on, on, on COVID, particularly on, on a totally uh, inequity uh, uh, of, of distribution of, of, of product and particularly the vaccines, but as well as diagnosis and treatment. So I will try to accelerate. I already mentioned that uh, to conduct our strategy, we have built uh, several clinical research platforms uh, in Africa, in Latin America, uh, and but we are, we are using a lot existing network. We are, when there is an existing network, there is no need to invest on this. So access, access, access uh, uh, is uh, well, is part of our uh, uh, strategy on at any stage. And uh, uh, of course, we, we could not be uh, the one providing the access. So it's, uh, it's a period of, of the life of a product for the day that we need to have a, a, a large network with, uh, of course, with, uh, with public institutions, with the governments, but uh, with, uh, with pharma uh, and, and sometimes with uh, some NGOs that help uh, in this field. But access is also part of uh, our initial strategy because when we dis define what we call the target product profile. So the characteristic of the product that we want to develop, we have access in mind, including uh, affordability uh, as a criteria. So I already mentioned that we, uh, we are advocating for change. Uh, it's a key element of our, our mission. Uh, well, maybe just one, one word on the, on the funding. So uh, today, uh, uh, we have secured a little bit more, almost 700 million euros uh, uh, to, to develop our strategy since 2003. Uh, we, we, for, for the strategic plan going uh, until 2028, we will need another uh, uh, 500 uh, uh, million. Uh, we have established a, a partnership with quite a lot of countries, the public funding remains uh, a large part of our funding. In terms of private funding, of course, we have quite a lot of partners, but the big one are uh, the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, and MSF that continue to be a, a, a financial supporter to, to the NDI. So I think with this, uh, I would like to conclude, and uh, thanks, thanks a lot for your attention, and uh, again, uh, thanks a lot for invent, inviting me uh, on, this, uh, on this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pico. Uh, this is a very inspiring talk and we uh, hear a lot from him about collaboration, bringing uh, innovation, translation to access, which is very important. Uh, it doesn't matter how good the research is, how good the innovation is, uh, it wouldn't have any meaning if without access. And in equity access, and that's very important. And I'm so glad that the NDI target to Denki, which is a, a, 
uh, uh, probably the newest, uh, uh, the, the latest uh, mission to achieve uh, disease, neglected diseases. Um, okay. Um, so uh, in this special academic session, we also have another two very um, distinguished speakers. And uh, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, um, Dr. Nitya Panupaka. Uh, Dr. Nitya is uh, Executive Director of the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, Dr. Nitya has deep interest in the key population-led health service, uh, which empower key population uh, lay providers who are members of the key population communities to design uh, and co-deliver HIV and STI services to their peers. Uh, she currently works uh, toward the establishment of the national accreditation and domestic financing system for lay providers to ensure that the uh, population-led health services are uh, sustainability. She provides ongoing research support to various implementation science and clinical trial studies, such as uh, um, being the uh, principal investigators or site investigator. She's also uh, the International Aid Society Governing Council uh, representatives of Asia and the Pacific Islands, and the, de and the deputy uh, editor of the Journal of International Aid Society of Tears, uh, and the joint editor of uh, Sexual Health. And uh, this is our uh, special opportunity to have uh, Dr. Nitya to um, join with us with this, uh, in this academic session. Um, and she'll be talking about the topic, uh, the, the, in the topic of uh, patient-centric approach and access-oriented uh, R&D. Dr. Nitya, please. All distinguished guests and all the audience um, joining us from um, outside of the room online um, as well. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate um, Dr. Picole um, as well as thank you for your excellent um, presentation. Um, and um, I, it, it is uh, my truly my great honor to be part of um, the PMAC um, Laureate's Academic Session uh, today. Um, I would like to um, start um, by um, saying that um, to end HIV uh, and for HIV, it's um, uh, 2030. Uh, we all know um, very well that we have the tools ready. We have antiretroviral treatment or ART to treat people with HIV. We have pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP um, to uh, give to people um, to prevent them from acquiring HIV. And now we have the status neutral approach, uh, which equalize the importance of HIV treatment and HIV prevention um, in a way that once people and individual coming in um, for HIV testing, um, they will be given um, equal importance regardless of their HIV status for those who tested HIV positive, um, they will be offered ART immediately to uh, bring them to the goal of having viral load suppression so that they can have zero risk of transmitting HIV sexually to other people, also known as undetectable equals untransmittable or U equals U. And at the same time, for those tested HIV negative, we also have PrEP uh, to be offered immediately as part of the combination HIV prevention package in order to bring them to the goal of having almost zero risk of acquiring HIV. And um, in Thailand, um, however, um, we know that ART is free, um, PrEP is free, HIV testing is free under our universal health coverage scheme. But the uptake of these um, services um, is not yet optimal, especially among key populations, because we know that we even like after these 40 years of um, knowing HIV, we still have this very strong and pervasive stigma. And it is not only stigma towards HIV itself, but it's stigma towards many characteristics of um, key affected populations, uh, which may include um, being sexual and gender, and gender minorities, um, being engaged in sex work, being engaged in substance use. And um, at the same time, there are also um, stigma related to HIV related services itself, like PrEP stigma, or U equals U stigma because all of these are related to HIV, are related to sex, are related to sexual pleasure with a taboo in our region. 
Um, and therefore, in 2015, in order to um, address the low uptake of HIV services among um, key uh, populations, um, mainly men who have sex with men and transgender women in Thailand, uh, we worked um, very closely with the um, community-based organization as well as uh, government partners to establish this key population-led health services or KPLHS. Um, in a way that key populations themselves are the one who design how service delivery should be and then co-deliver the services. And this is to ensure that these HIV and sexual health services are needs-based, demand-driven and client-centered. And all these um, services are delivered by trained and qualified key population lay providers. So they are um, someone who are often members of key populations themselves. And this is um, with an aim uh, for KPLHS to fill in service gaps commonly faced by key populations. Uh, and therefore the services are designed to be accessible with um, clinic location in hotspots and clinic operation hours during uh, flexible service hours and uh, for the services to be available. So uh, the services yeah, will yeah, need to be um, tailored according to health priorities of each key population. So if you want to work with um, transgender population, then you integrate gender affirming care uh, to get with sexual health uh, because gender affirmation is the, the health priorities of transgender population. Or if you want to serve um, sex workers, then you design um, the services to integrate legal consultation with um, sexual health services. That, that's just um, uh, some example. And then the services are also designed to be acceptable, to be provided in a um, stigma-free environment, in judgmental-free um, environment, and provided by staff who are members of key populations so they understand where very well the lifestyles of the populations and they speak uh, the same language. And lastly, for the services to be of high quality, to be um, trusted by um, partners in the public health system so that uh, whenever um, referral are needed, uh, they can be um, um, conducted um, immediately. And so therefore, since 2015, we have seen that HIV testing um, in our country uh, among MSM and transgender women have uh, increased dramatically. And, and right now uh, with only like 10 to 12 um, community-led clinics um, serving these key populations in seven provinces, we were able to provide HIV test testing to more than half of MSM and transgender women in our country. And um, as uh, equally important is that these clinics are also um, able to provide more than half and almost um, 60 to 70% of um, PrEP uh, users um, in our country. So we use all these data, this information to successfully advocate with policymakers, to advocate with um, healthcare professional institutions uh, to support the Ministry of Public Health um, to legalize legalize the role of key population lay providers. So according to this 2019 MOPH regulations, our key uh, population lay providers were able to um, perform sample collection um, through finger finger prick um, blood collection and um, swaps uh, from uh, different anatomical um, sites um, to run uh, the point of care uh, laboratory assays for HIV and STIs um, and also to uh, uh, dispense the PrEP PEP, and also oral STI treatment as prescribed uh, by the doctors. Um, and why do we need uh, for these services to be legalized? It's because we would like to, uh, we, we aim uh, for the sustainability of KPLHS uh, in a way that once uh, this is legalized, this, uh, the KP lab providers are certified, the services that they are providing, which contributes to more than half of HIV services uh, for key populations in our country should be directly reimbursed uh, from the government. And this is uh, happening, although slowly um, right now, um, these KP lab providers providers can reimburse their HIV testing um, costs, but not yet uh, for PrEP. Um, and right and now I would like to switch a bit to HCV. 
to hepatitis C um, virus infection. And we can see from this slide that um, there is an explosive um, hep C epidemic uh, in our country among men who have sex with men. Uh, you can see that the incidence of hep C um, has risen uh, quite dramatically from less than 1% per year to now uh, almost 5% per year. And we know that hep C um, incident cases are strongly um, linked to being HIV positive, um, to um, engaging in chem sex, uh, to um, having uh, group sex, and uh, to having um, other sexually transmitted infections. Um, so with this information, we then uh, introduced ant routine anti-hep C uh, testing into our KPLHS uh, clinic serving these key populations uh, to identify that um, the prevalence was around 2.5% and mainly concentrated among um, those who are HIV positive or who are PrEP users. But the key challenges that you can see here is that we were were able to successfully refer uh, people who have positive anti-hep C to get HCV RNA confirmation in less than half of them. And among the rest, 20% um, already lost to follow up um, here. So there are a major uh, gap um, here. Um, so as KPLHS providers, as, as part of the KPLHS providers uh, team, we um, then have these questions. Can KPLA providers run HCV RNA confirmation using point of care assay? Because these are all ready used in KPLHS clinics for gonorrhea, uh, chlamydia testing, and, and HIV RNA. And then can KPLA providers give out same day DAA treatment through teleconsultation with doctors? Because this uh, teleconsultation system has already been used to provide PrEP um, to more than 10,000 people in the country um, already. And we know uh, from our heart that the answers to these questions are yes, but yes, only if hepatologists have the same mindset with and trust in primary healthcare system and KP lab providers, and maybe only if HCV, RNA, and DAA are affordable outside of the NHSO system. So uh, this will be our next demonstration project um, to see if key population-led same-day hep C test and treat uh, model can be um, conducted for MSM uh, and transgender women population. So I just would like to uh, conclude here that uh, we can see that the people-centered approach and the key population-led or community-led um, approach can certainly be adapted to fit other health conditions. Uh, we have seen um, this for HIV, hepatitis C, and COVID-19. Um, and, and, and I have to say that the community-led response uh, has saved um, Bangkok um, from the crisis of COVID-19 um, during the last year. And all of this can be done through the three principles uh, shown here. The first one um, is to know um, which clinical roles can be demedicalized, can be task shifted to the people in the community. And then secondly, to know which clinical steps can be simplified or can be removed. And lastly, is to know which clients need less or need more intensive care so that we can differentiate our resources accordingly. Um, but for these uh, three principles to become successful, uh, it can be, are done not only through advancement in health technology, but also we need advancement in healthcare professionals mindset, the mindset that would agree, that would support uh, the handing back of healthcare responsibilities uh, to people, to individuals in the community. Um, so I will end here and thank you very much. Sorry, Ka Ajahn Kunkanya, you are still on mute uh, from uh, the room. Do you hear me now? Yes, Ka. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Nitya. You, you have raised the important points of the um, community uh, uh, participation of uh, uh, key population-led uh, uh, approach uh, to deliver services. And that is very important jigsaw because we can have the innovation translation to accessibility, 
but that accessibility and affordability will not reach to the patient's hand unless we have the very appropriate approach to a specific group of populations. So it's very important that we have um, uh, uh, the community-led or patient-centric approach. Uh, thank you so much. So, so we have a very important um, uh, speaker to fill in all the jigsaws. And this is uh, Dr. Yot. Dr. Yotira Watananon, um, she, he is our last speaker, but very important, um, uh, per, uh, 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 very important factor to fill in all this uh, innovation to access, translation to access. Dr. Yod is a medical doctor in uh, and health economist by training. He founded the Thai Ministry of Public Health, uh, Health Intervention and Technology Assessment Program, or HITAP. He's also a co-founder of Asia uh, HTA Network, uh, the HT Asia Link, um, and the International Decision Support Initiative, or IDSI. Um, these works uh, have been used to inform the health benefit package development in Thailand and elsewhere ar across the globe. Uh, he has provided capacity building in health technology assessment and health economic uh, evaluations uh, to several, several countries. Uh, I counted the countries that you name uh, that you have contributed like more than 18 countries and would be more and more, uh, such as Bhutan, China, Ethiopia, Ghana, India, uh, very long list. And since uh, 2018, he's also uh, served as a visiting professor at uh, Cecil Hop School of Public Health at National University of Singapore. Not just in Thailand, he's uh, also um, uh, uh, holding academic position and contributing uh, with, uh, you know, with his expertise in a lot of uh, settings to ensure that uh, health technology assessment would play uh, a good role in uh, improving accessibility to innovations. And uh, please welcome Dr. Yot to uh, give us a talk in this topic. Dr. Yot, please. Thank you, uh, Atani, uh, thank you, Kinja, for your kind introduction and for the large hospital uh, in having me in the panel. And uh, I would like to also start uh, my talk uh, to congratulate to uh, Bernard and uh, DNDI for your this uh, Prince Mahidon Award. Uh, I read, um, actually I admire and I read about the DNDI since its inception and, and, that, and on the left hand side of my slides, that is when I cut from the, the Nature's uh, journals a few years ago when they are introducing uh, your DNDI, which is have very ambitious plan but it's also the practical uh, uh, implementations. Uh, so my, my talk today will focus uh, with others. Uh, speaker is about on access. Uh, having said that, I think um, I bring this um, access uh, framework that uh, they are mentioning about uh, to to achieve the access. We need to have the availabilities, uh, affordabilities, accommodation, and acceptabilities. And I see myself, um, uh, I, I see that the NDI is now is, uh, doing a very good job in trying to improve availability of uh, neglected disease treatment and with uh, or at the affordable, affordable price. So that, that is, I think, uh, the, the big contribution for global community from the NDI and the like. Uh, ha having said that, I still think that there are remaining challenges that the countries uh, need to also to collaborate and, and contribute to improve access. That is namely accommodations. Uh, accommodation is mean the way that uh, healthcare system accommodate or make it feasible to provide those technologies. And acceptability is, in my talk, we mean on two level. One is political acceptability. Another one is acceptability is at the practical level is mean uh, on the best side. Um, so I, I'm trying to elaborate first, why do we need to care about accommodations? I give, uh, I think doc, uh, Dr. Nitya also give very good example of uh, the, the, the use of key population to support or to make it the, the screening and treatment available for 
uh, patient with stigma. Uh, I also very fortunate to work with um, colleagues from Indonesia and the Philippines a few years ago when they are introducing universal health care coverage and they are struggling to provide universal renal dialysis. Uh, and uh, after a few years of introduction of le universal renal dialysis in these two countries, renal dialysis become the biggest reimbursement items under JKN, which is equivalent to NHSO in Thailand and the field health of the Philippines. So they are the, the, the biggest uh, um, treatment, they, they are the, the biggest reimbursable treatment in these two countries. And hemodialysis is the dominant part of the you know, replacement therapy. Oh, because of more than 90% of uh, end state renal disease patients undertaking this, this uh, dialysis modalities. But you can imagine the Philippines and Indonesia, they have uh, 10,000 of Iceland and at least 1,000 of Iceland with habitants. So it's, it means that. Uh, it can be possible that every island have uh, instead you know disease patients. Uh, having said that, these two countries only have less than fifty island each uh, with hemodialysis center. So it's almost impossible for for them to provide equitable access to renal dialysis. And this is uh, this is the way that we 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 can see that why accommodation is very important to ensure uh, equitable access, even the the uh, affordable uh, and good quality of service is available. Um, uh, so uh, we work with the Philippines and Indonesia trying to um, do policy analysis and to see the feasibility of introducing what Thailand have done for decades in terms of uh, using PD first policy. P PD stands for Peritoneal Diocese, which is another mode, mode of uh, you know, replacement therapies, but it's much more accessible, especially people in the rural areas. Uh, I took one photo uh, from on the left-hand side, when we have the, the big flood in Thailand of, uh, many years ago, uh, and also recently on COVID-19, when many hospitals are shutting down. Uh, you see that PD is really resilient because it still be able to provide a service. In Thailand, we deliver um, renal dialysis, uh, to the home of the patients uh, by uh, postal service. And, and we do the uh, economic analysis and budget impact analysis to inform the, the feasibility of introducing PD first policy uh, in the Philippines. And that is uh, something that the Philippines government is uh, uh, trying to do a pilot in, in, in these countries. Um, at, at the same time, uh, when we look at uh, on uh, Lino dialysis machine uh, for hemodialysis. Uh, this technology is developed, I think, almost 100 years ago. But since then, it's, it's rarely improved. Uh, even we have many uh, technology development. Uh, we, the mobile phone we uh, make from very big, uh, the, the, the mobile phone until now, so it's very, very small. And uh, from very expensive, now it's affordable price for most of people in the world. However, on um, a hemo a hemodialysis machine, the technology is not much um, improved uh, since uh, 100 years ago. So recently, uh, I give a story of uh, the Australian government to make a very really brave approach by um, developing um, a grand challenge. So they announced uh, to global communities uh, for any uh, scientists who can uh, promised to develop um, hemodialysis machine from the cost at the at the current is allowed um, ten thousand US dollar per machine to be less than thousand US dollar per machine. The cost of running dialysis from hundred to be less than ten US dollar. Uh, that is the starting around five years ago. Um, I'm I'm lucky to be part of of that initiative and finally we have one. Uh, engineer from uh, US, but living in China, who won the competitions. And now they are producing on the right hand side is the hemodialysis machine that promised to run at the, uh, the cost of uh, building is less than uh, is a hundred of uh, US dollar. And the cost of running uh, 
the dialysis section is less than five years dollar. Now they are entered to the uh, first clinical trial in human uh, in many countries. Uh, so, so this is something that we need maybe much more. Uh, we need the NDI, we need to have this kind of, um, of global and, and international communities uh, to provide uh, more affordable uh, uh, and accessible solutions that also accommodate. So this, uh, I forget to say that this uh, dialysis machine not need uh, electric, but they, they, they use solar power and they not, not need uh, to have uh, sterile water, but they can use pipe water. Uh, that is about accommodations. I talk a little bit about acceptability. Uh, I already said that I think there are two, at least two level of acceptability that we need. One is at policy level, another one at the practical uh, level. Um, you can, uh, people may, may think that uh, we have good technologies, then people will be able to assess. Uh, it, Bernard and uh, Dr. Nityas already show that this is not true. The same for, for me in my areas that I'm doing health system and policy research. I, I used it to dream that when we have a better evidence, then uh, there will be a better decision made based on that evidence. But it's also, it's not true. Um, until we, we were at HITAP and we found that another missing jigsaw is a better process. You need to have a, a evidence based participant participatories and, and transparent process to being evidence to be discussed with stakeholder empower them. And that is uh, likely to lead to a better decision and better health. So I give you a, 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 few, a very short examples. Uh, in Thailand, um, when we develop a health benefit package, both on pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical, we always allow stakeholders. So this is for example on the, the uh, essential medicine list uh, development in Thailand, we allow 24 group of clinical experts to be able to dominate the new medicines to be part of the, the pharmaceutical reimbursement list in Thailand. And, and we have a committees who are uh, consisted of not only clinicians and policy makers, but also uh, patient representatives in that committee selecting technologies and using evidence, including economic evaluation and budget impact analysis. The same for NHS, though I saw that that is here. Uh, they have a very good uh, uh, process to develop benefit package for non-pharmaceutical, including diagnostics, screening, and public health intervention. They allow uh, several group of stakeholders, including public representatives, civil societies, and industry to be able to nominate the topic and then they do uh, prioritization and using evidence to make a final decision. So the, the, you can see that uh, the, the, the case of hepatitis C in Thailand, we not only get the topic nominated by health professionals and set priorities by patient representatives, but we also using evidence. And they, when the evidence generation, we also involve many group of stakeholders. You can see that a, a few examples of uh, stakeholder meeting. I you, you see that uh, um, also professor from Sirila Fausto also taking part um, of, of that uh, stakeholder meeting. And we, we, we do a series of consultation when we have preliminary um, studies. We, even before conducting study, we also uh, having stakeholders to fight your research question and score. And then uh, uh, when we have preliminary result, we also consult stakeholders to see the, to verify and validate the result and fight your policy recommendation. And that leads to a policy decision. So this is my um, last slide. I think a collective effort is, is, is equal to collective achievement. So uh, thanks to ND, NDI and, and industry that they are developing uh, technology and innovations. But we also need uh, to have collaboration with regulatory agency like uh, the Thai FDAs, policy maker and partners like NHSOs, uh, HST agencies like HITAP and, and other university units who are produ producing evidence to support um, uh, decision makers and decision making body provider at like a civilized hospital that they need to modify and they, they need to make uh, themselves uh, to be able to accommodate new technology to be in their uh, service and also health professional groups um, patients and the public so 
to some artists, I mean, this is a business that all of us is not only the one, and we need to to work together uh, toward the achievement that we want to see is uh, the patient who can get access to screening and treatment that they need. It. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Yod. He's actually mentioned a very important part of uh, 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 of the issue that. Uh, you know, uh, having the health uh, technology assessment to push the policy and make uh, treatment into the hands of the patient. Okay, so uh, lastly, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Picao again to uh, give us further comments uh, after uh, listening to all the uh, speakers. Uh, Dr. Picao. Okay, thank you. Um... I have to say I was very happy with uh, those comments because I, uh, of course, when you present uh, the portfolio of the NDI, you have no time to cover all the aspect. Uh, but I'm very, very uh, supportive to the fact that uh, uh, you need to have a, a new product being developed and available. They need to be affordable, it's key, uh, but they need to be uh, accepted. Uh, the acceptability is, uh, is, a, is a key element uh, of, of, of the program and uh, and uh, and here of course the association with the uh, with the communities of patients association with a uh, with a practitioner with the uh, medical doctors and nurses that are contributed is extremely important and and uh, I mentioned it in a little bit in my presentation it's important when you start uh, uh, your research because you need to be guided by by those, but it's very important at the end because you need to translate uh, your innovation into something that uh, the public health system could integrate. So I've uh, I made reference to, to sleeping sickness where, uh, you know, with an oral treatment, you can imagine to treat people at the primary health care level. Uh, until now, to be treated by sleeping sickness, people have to be transferred to a big hospital. In Republic Democratic of Congo, it means that sometimes you have to travel for one day, two days, three days of traveling. So the access to treatment is not realistic. But uh, I want to use another example that we also had in our portfolio is the example of HIV pediatric. Because we were invited to enter into HIV pediatric, uh, even if HIV today, in terms of innovation, is not really a neglected disease. But the, the children, and particularly the young kids, were very neglected because uh, for many years, uh, the only treatment available for them was uh, a liquid formulation of lopinavir ritonavir on a base of a syrup. The syrup was uh, constituted of the solvent was alcohol, so very toxic. The test was very bad. And it's a treatment that the, the kids, small kids, have to take uh, twice a day. So we were invited by the community, including, of course, in this case, MSF, putting pressure on us to develop a new treatment for HIV pediatric, which seems to be uh, simple, but at the end of the day was a little bit more complicated because we, our ambition was to develop what we call a four-in-one. So having lopinavir, etonavir, abacavir, lamivudine in the same formulation. And at the end, we, uh, we develop a capsule uh, containing a powder and, and with the four drugs that you can just open the capsule, put it on, on, on food, on milk, and being upset. So I think this was a challenge technically, but uh, I will not insist on the technical aspect. What was important is that we have tested the acceptability of this uh, in a field in, in Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya. And, and this was incredibly uh, a, a major change. Unfortunately, uh, for the time being, uh, we are dependent on, on the registration process. Uh, by FDA because this program was uh, was uh, supported by so through PEFA, and FDA doesn't consider this as a top priority. So during this crisis, they are, they've just delayed, delayed, delayed. A good demonstration that probably uh, we need to start working with the uh, regulatory authorities in country directly where the where the problem exists, and because they will consider this as a top priority in the review. Because here we have an excellent product, very adapted to the condition of the children that is not used because of the obstacle of regulatory. So we have, we have also to keep in mind this aspect that uh, uh, to, be, to have a close relationship with the regulatory authorities because it's an important uh, step and barrier uh, in uh, all the process. 
Okay, so I think uh, it was my uh, my initial comments to, just to, to go on. Uh, uh, and I know that after we have a session to discuss FC, uh, uh, I'm sure that on hepatitis C, uh, looking at the curve uh, uh, presented before, I think we can have a good discussion here because we can make a lot of progress with, uh, with new product. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Pico. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for, uh, for the discussion and uh, question and answer. So, um, uh, so the, the participants, if you have any uh, uh, questions, uh, you can just uh, put in the chat box and uh, uh, raise your question to us. But um, at, at this point, I, I like uh, for each panelist perhaps to mention a bit about, you know, in your roles, in your point of view, um, what are the remaining gaps uh, uh, that, you know, uh, in your in, 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 in your jurisdiction uh, that could be, um, you know, uh, improve the accessibility um, and is, uh, what would be the solution, uh, how to achieve uh, that challenges. Uh, perhaps I start with uh, Dr. Yod and then Dr. Nitaya. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think there are many uh, things we can do, but one thing I will mention now, because uh, Bernard is here, the NDI is here, is is about linking uh, between uh, policy implementations and R and D. I think uh, people always see this are to end. Uh, at the beginning, is we think about R and D, and then at the end, we think about policy implementation. Actually, I I, I don't see it is like a linear line, but it's, it can be a circle. Uh, I give you one of the 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 the, the idea to implement it is uh, I use a metaphor of uh, visa on application. Many uh, I have many friends from India uh, who who want to come to Thailand for holidays before COVID for, for sure, um, and they need to like uh, apply for uh, vacations. They need to book air ticket. They need to book hotel in Thailand. But India, uh, well, fortunately, un unfortunately, I don't know. We we don't need them visa before they depart from India. But they can come to our uh, Suvarnabhum airport and then uh, apply for visa on arrival. And then uh, many of them may be able to enjoy holiday, but some of them will be rejected because of the the so the consideration by immigration said they are not approved. So for this people, they need to fly back for the next flight to India. I think there is a waste a lot of time and effort. The same for, for research innovations, for medical innovations. I think, I'll, but, but the chance of being rejected is much more than we, we saw on arrival for Indian people come to Thailand. So may, many of um, innovative products, they spend 10 years or 20 years research and doing clinical studies and, and many millions, hundreds of millions or billions of uh, US dollars in development. And then they, they even they can register to the FDA, but they be stuck to get passed on health technology assessment or, or, or policy criteria to make it widely available under public program. And then they become only for private market. So I, I hope that uh, we can, we now, we, for example, in Thailand, we have very clear criteria when and how technologies become uh, part of benefit package. You know, the trade shows um, how many 106, uh, 160,000 by per quality. If you not produce uh, technologies that beyond this trade shows, very likely that you will get be part of the benefit package and you know that the how much we can afford etc why not we try to bring this knowledge back to to r and d and inform r and d what kind of product that we need so in in our uh, field we call early health technology assessment we can use that early health technology assessment to guide target product profile and then to provide information for r and d the target product, the type of technology, the, the user of technology that will make it 
good value for money and impactful in our country. By doing this, I think at least three things that we can achieve together. First is that R and D will be more efficient. So you have low, you have you have lower risk of being failed at the beginning. So and even you you are developing technology and you know that it's not going to achieve the target, you can stop beforehand. So that is it makes it more efficient and less cost in development. Second is that we make technology faster to access to 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 the public because we do assessment beforehand. Once its product is viable, it will be really easy and it really might uh, marginal effort to do that. And the last one is uh, you will get the, the the technology that uh, really uh, fill the 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 need and fill the gap. So I think by doing this uh, together, it may be uh, more uh, successful of product development. Oh, very important affordability from the beginning, uh, from scratch. Uh, uh, Dr. Nitya Ka. Yeah, thank you very much, Ajahn Kun Kanyaka. That's a very important question. Um, and for me, I feel that um, there, there could be uh, several things that we can uh, make uh, better. Um, and one thing is that I think as the researchers working in the field, uh, we probably would want to um, focus more on the use of um, um, good participatory participatory practice um, principle in any um, clinical trials. It may start uh, from, from HIV uh, prevention uh, trials, but I, I believe that it can be applied for any um, types of trials. And by saying this, it means that uh, when you think about um, participation, you will need to think about all stakeholders. Um, and think with an end in mind. Um, so that will kind of like um, automatically force you to think of some stakeholders that you may not think of when planning a clinical trials, um, like those who are end users, those who are patients, those, those who are communities, as well as those who are policy makers, those who are regulatory bodies. And I think um, we, I mean, in general, as a researchers, we may need to like take more courage in talking to end users in talking to policymakers or regulatory bodies. And, and that will certainly speed up um, the translation from science into implementation. And I think, I think that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that um, for the R&D itself, um, we, again, as a researchers, uh, probably will need to think more and more outside of the box um, and um, don't like um, keep our like close mindset of, of, of what just wanting to do what we have been doing for the past um, decades. Um, and here uh, we may start to hear more about, um, let's say, experimental medicine uh, to speed up the process of selection of potential products that can move forward to uh, phase one, two or three um, studies. Uh, we start to hear more, um, especially during COVID-19 uh, time, that um, clinical studies that exclude um, pregnant women, uh, breastfeeding women, or children, adolescents may kind of harm um, the pandemic um, than be fruitful for the pandemic. So, so think of something outside of the box uh, would be very um, important um, as well. And then lastly, um, I think that um, all of this will need to be happening in parallel. Um, and we have learned um, repeatedly the, the, the hard lessons uh, from the implementation of ART, from the implementation of PrEP, um, that we always like wait until we get the result from the RCTs before we start talking with our regulatory bodies, with our um, um, uh, policy makers uh, and consult the communities. And, and I think we should end um, the, the pattern of, of um, doing uh, this because it has proved uh, as a failure uh, in um, quickly translating um, science into actions. And, and um, by doing um, the parallel system, um, working with the regulatory body and um, policymakers while you are um, fighting products or while you are running the clinical trials will certainly speed up um, this process. And I, I think um, many um, examples can be seen here. I don't know if let's say for Ravidasvia um, that 
we know of the results um, more than a year ago, I guess. Um, and we still don't have that discussed at a country level um, here. Uh, that could be an example of how we can do it better um, next time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ka. Finally, to you, Bernard, uh, not just the challenge and the gaps that uh, i like you to mention more, but also uh, the collaborative works uh, and um, probably uh, inspiring the um, new generation, the younger, uh, the young researchers and doctors that they um, have to uh, you know, future with our future work in collaboration with other people in the different backgrounds to achieve the best uh, and uh, thinking about uh, technology translation to access and ensure that uh, things will be just like we uh, would like to be. So, so that uh, patients, particularly the neglected patients can achieve the most appropriate treatment they uh, deserve for. Uh, not please. Okay, thank you. So I would like to insist on, on three uh, keywords. Uh, one, you invite me to talk about collaboration. Second one is open source. And so, the third one is equity. So collaboration, uh, okay, I totally agree that is key, fundamental. Collaboration among uh, different uh, uh, sort of partners, we need to bring around the table, the, all the key partners, uh, the, the patients, uh, the, the practitioner, but also the different institutions that that decide, but collaboration means also that the country work together. So South South, of course, but not only South South, North South, because this increases the chance to succeed. Uh, I, I think the big demonstration, in fact, was during this uh, COVID crisis, that where a number of, of clinical studies have been conducted all over the world with very little collaboration, and at the end, very little results, except on the field of vaccine, where uh, typically uh, it was driven by, by industry, but collaboration among the country, among uh, academic has, has not been perfect at all during, during this period of time. Second point is open source, but an open source means that uh, we share uh, the scientific data. So I think it's important at the scientific level. We share the data uh, uh, on, a, on a different studies, on a very open way. So we share positive results, but we share negative results. They are, they are extremely important to understand uh, how to do. We share the cost uh, because the problem is that uh, very often we don't know at all uh, uh, how much it costs to, to, to produce, to develop, to produce uh, something. So this is extremely important. And this for me is the basis also for something that is very important for Thailand, but for, for several countries is to, to offer the possibility to, to go into transfer of technology. Because transfer of technology for me is extremely important to uh, secure uh, uh, the, the availability of product, but also secure the capacity to, to, to be even more innovative. And my last point is on equity. And equity, of course, I'm uh, very unhappy with, uh, with the current situation on, on, on COVID. Uh, concerning the vaccines, uh, concerning the diagnosis, because uh, you know, in many African countries today, you have no access to diagnosis, uh, except if you pay uh, $50, uh, and, and very few people could, could pay $50, so it's diagnosis. And I'm afraid that this will be the same for the new antiviral treatment, because now uh, we have perspective probably to have very good antiviral treatment that could be used very early uh, in the process, but unfortunately, uh, the initial price is 750 uh, US dollar per treatment for five days treatment of an antiviral, which is totally uh, stupid. And, and here, uh, I would like to refer to uh, an experience, that, uh, a close experience that I have with Thailand when I was leading the access to essential medicine uh, campaign, plus on HIV. And Thailand, at the beginning of the, to the year 2000, was very active. Uh, to promote equity uh, on, on treatment, uh, very active, promote equity and treatment in Thailand, of course, but the, the experience of Thailand had a lot of influence for the rest of the world. So I think typically uh, for me, equity should be very part of our vision. <laughs>
Uh, I think uh, for me, key. So I invite you, uh, colleagues and uh, and friends, to to work on on this. Uh, I'm sure that we could repeat uh, the story of uh, of, uh, of HIV uh, uh, with the, with the capacity of of, uh, of of researchers in Thailand, but also the capacity of the of the, of the authorities, the capacity of uh, of the of, of the uh, pharma uh, company in the region to to, to do the job. So I think. Uh, here is a, is a request um, I'm sending to you.